So, um, welcome everybody. And uh, this is Adriana Pinsky, Pinsky? Pinsky. From, Pins <laughs> from the University of Cape Town's eResearch Center. And she'll be talking about Python assisted creative writing with genderizer. So, yeah, give her a hand. Hello, everyone. Today I'm talking about something which has absolutely nothing to do with my work. Um, for the past almost 20 years, I've been involved with a local role playing community, and I have written several scenarios for local role players. Um, and today I'm going to talk about something that I have found relatively easy to do as a programmer, which is not so easy to do for people who are not programmers. And I talk about a tool that I've made to try to assist people so that anyone can have the same option. Um, so what are RPGs? What do I mean by role-playing games? Um, it's a kind of interactive storytelling. Um, there's, in general, people get together, they create characters who are made up, and they participate in a story, they describe what they're trying to do, and usually a game master who drives what happens in the world and sets up the situation, responds to what they do and resolves what happens. And sometimes there's some kind of system for conflict resolution with dice randomization, um, but that's not very really relevant to this talk. Um, so there are tabletop role-playing games, which you may have heard of, things like D&D, World Darkness, Pathfinder. Um, there are also live action games, also known as LARPs. Um, there are different kinds of LARPs uh, in the US and I think a lot of Scandinavia. This is a massive outdoor event where people dress up as elves and wizards and they hit each other with foam rubber swords and they throw bean bags at each other and pretend they're magic spells. So that's not the kind I'm talking about. The kind that I'm used to in South Africa um, is something called a theater style LARP, which is a lot more sedate, it happens indoors, small number of people. Um, there isn't any physical conflict. It's 99% just walking around and talking to other people. Um, there are also different kind, different levels of preparation in role-playing games. Uh, some games are very spontaneous. They're kind of generated on the fly. So ongoing campaigns where people get together every week at someone's house and there's a continuing story. Usually the GM makes some rough notes, but in general they make everything up on the fly. They don't work from a, like a printed document. Um, but there are also pre-written scenarios. Uh, for example, people can show up at a gaming convention and just sit down at a table and they get given a little booklet with some stuff in it and the game is run from out of the booklet. Everything is prepared and already there. And also, our local theater style labs generally are also pre-written. Um, so my focus is on pre-written scenarios with pre-written characters because that's, what's, that's the kind of scenario that I write. Um, Pre-written characters because some of the tabletop scenarios are designed to be slotted into an existing campaign with anyone's characters. Um, so some technical and practical details which um, may be non-obvious if you're not in the community. Um, the differences between tabletop RPGs and LARPs. Um, in tabletop RPGs, the game master is an, inter an interaction bottleneck. In general, all the players have to talk to the game master and get feedback for their for their actions because the game master is sort of the arbiter of what happens in the world. So uh, the communication within the game is kind of like a start apology, although there is some kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication on the sides, uh, which usually limits the ideal number of players to four or five because any more than that, and it's difficult for the GM to actually give everyone a slice of their attention. Um, people in Joburg who have conflict, like, Convention modules with six to eight characters. I will fight you. We can meet outside. That is not a reasonable number of players. Um, on the other hand, LARPs, at least theater style LARPs, have mostly peer to peer interactions. Uh, th there are GMs who do keep track of some kind of global variables, but they're not really involved in all of the interactions that are happening. The LARP mostly just runs itself with people talking to each other, and very seldom do they call in a GM to arbitrate something that they can't just decide uh, between themselves. And that means that LARPs usually are much larger. They usually have 10 players or more. So tabletop RPGs, there are many available that have been written locally, like in Cape Town and Joburg, and there's a low demand for them, by which I mean people are perfectly happy to come to a convention and play a once of game there, but they're not super keen to seek out once of games to play at home because they're usually involved in campaigns, and that's, that's the way that they play when they play at home. On the other hand, LARPs, there are relatively few of them available, uh, maybe like my estimate would be a tenth of the number have been written ever in South Africa by locals, and there's a high demand for them because there isn't really such a thing as at-home campaign LARPing. Y if you want to LARP, you need to come to like an organized event that someone has organized. 
Um, so tabletop RPGs usually are run once in parallel at the convention that they were written for. So a person makes a, makes a game and brings it to a convention and say five tables, run them at, a, at, at the same time. And then after that, there isn't really very much interest. Maybe someone will find that module and run it again for some people who are interested, but it's not really, people aren't really that interested in rerunning them. On the other hand, LARPs are rerun every few months or years, essentially whenever there are enough players who are interested in playing in that LARP. Because you can't really play twice because you know all the secrets and like all the plot elements. Although sometimes it's been so long that you really can't remember, and then you get pulled in at the last minute, sometimes many times because the, there's an emergency and someone's dropped out. But in general, like you, you only play it once. So tabletop RPG, um, written scenarios are standalone documents. They are written to be run by another person who is not the writer and who knows absolutely nothing. They're supposed to contain everything that you need to run that game. Uh, LARPs, on the other hand, in theory you could do that, but in practice, they are these perpetual drafts, which are usually run by the people who wrote them, who have kind of jotted down some notes for themselves because they'll totally forget next time, but a lot of the stuff they just have in their heads and it's never properly you know, finished and written down. Um, so. Tabletop modules are written, they're finished, they're done, they're generally not revisited, but LARPs are constantly tweaked and updated as a result of player feedback and GM observations during every new run. This, we're always fiddling with the balance and, oh, this character was really bored this time, maybe they just have something to do, and it, it, it never ends. So tabletop RPGs, the entire document is usually public facing, we lay it out nicely, we make a little book, and we, we give it to people. Uh, LARPs, all our GM notes are this horrible, tangled mess, but the character sheets, which are actually given to people, those are, those are um, public facing, and they are supposed to you know, look nice. Um, tabletop RPGs have like, relatively short character sheets, which are given out at the table and people sit down, uh, whereas LARPs have considerably longer character sheets, which necessitate more attentive reading, so we usually mail them out at least a week in advance. People have a time to read them and, and absorb what's in them. So, Gendered characters make organization of LARPs really difficult and annoying. So when you're organizing a LARP, you have to cast every character because every character is a little piece of the puzzle of the entire story and you can't just be missing some of the pieces. Everyone has to show up. It's important for the LARP to, to happen for every character to have a player. So this is typically over 10 characters, so it's hard enough to organize it as it is. You need to wrangle more than 10 people to all commit to come to the same place at the same time, to prepare, to get a costume, to read their character sheet properly. You know, it's a bit of a commitment. Um, and because these character sheets are pre-written, you may have a gender mismatch between what's in the character sheets and your available player pool. Um, and there's nothing more annoying than having a LARP where you're struggling to find more dudes to fill the male character roles while you have like 10 women on the, mailing, on like the waiting list, but you know, you, that's not what you need. So there's generally less willingness for cross-gender play in LARPs. Um, for tabletop modules, people don't generally care. There's like a certain degree of remove between you and the character when you're sitting at a table and describing your actions. But when you actually dress up and walk around and pretend to be someone, most people prefer to play a character that matches their own real life gender. So the organizer needs to match demographics, and this is annoying, uh, especially annoying with old LARPs. Um, there are LARPs that are written like 20 years ago where most of the people in the role, local role-playing community were men. Now we have pretty much gender parity. Sometimes when you, when you advertise a LARP, you have many more women signing up than men. Um, so some of these really nice old LARPs are difficult to run because like, the demographics are just not like that anymore. Um, and it's especially irritating if someone drops out because now you have, to, you have an extra criterion that you have to deal with the last minute while you're looking for someone who'd fill this role. So what do we do about it? So there, is, there has been a rise in cross-gender casting um, in the local community. There are more people who are willing to play characters of a different gender, you know, which is cool. But why should you adjust the players to the scenario? Why don't we adjust the scenario to the players? Why don't we just write characters that can be played by a person of any gender? That's, that's simple, like, let's just do that. Okay, but now we have a new problem. So you might think that this is simple because all we have to do is to make two copies of each character sheet, one of them for John Smith and one of them for Jane Smith, except that's unfortunately not how English works. So character sheets are generally written in the second person. You know, this is who you are, here is your history. But the problem is with third person pronouns. So actually, we'd have to rewrite every other character sheet. So every person who refers to a particular person will refer to them as he or she. So if you have one flexible character in your LARP, that would mean that you have to maintain two copies of the LARP. If you have two flexible characters, you need to maintain four copies, one for every possible combination of those two characters. 10 
flexible characters, 1,024 copies. Clearly, this is not something you can do by hand. That would be ridiculous, uh, especially since you're not just going to laboriously do this one time. As I said before, we're constantly evolving and changing these LARPs, so we want to have one master copy where we can make a change and not like 1,024 of them. So we can make do with a shortcut. We can just ignore the issue and tell players to make a substitution. We can tell them, okay, this, this person, it says in the text that it's a guy, but actually it's a woman. Or we can just use a gender neutral pronoun anywhere, like, everywhere like they. But in my opinion, this breaks immersion and can be distracting and confusing. Um, so, you know, I don't want players to read my character sheets and have to keep thinking, okay, this is a guy, but it's actually not a guy. Or to read they when I consider that to be either a gender neutral pronoun or a pronoun which, you know, is people who, who don't identify with gender select for themselves. But it's not something that should be used when you actually know the gender and it's supposed to be male or female. So I'm a perfectionist. I want my public facing writing to be polished and I like to make my, my LARPs as immersive as possible. So I would really like to have some kind of automated solution which actually will go in there and replace the pronouns so it would be a completely seamless experience. So how do you do this properly? Well, it's easy if you're a programmer because this is, it's a relatively simple script at the core of it. But for a programmer, this is not really possible. It's not, you can't just do a straight search and replace because, for example, in the feminine pronouns, there are two distinct uses of her, and in the um, masculine pronouns, there are two distinct uses of his, and they're not the same in the same places. You can't just do a straight search and replace. You, you can't do that. And obviously, you also can't distinguish between like whose pronouns are whose. Um, so you need to have a more complex solution, and this is beyond the abilities of simple text editors. Um, so how to empower non-technical writers so that anyone who is not a programmer who wants to write LARPs can just do this thing in their writing. Um, so I wanted to make a tool that anyone can use, which has imposed certain constraints. Um, so portability, I wanted it to be um, just a single thing, which is simple, and people can know that they, they can fetch like one script from somewhere, and that's all they need, a single file. They don't have to remember to put like you know three files in different places. I wanted it to be easy to install, ideally with no dependencies, because that adds more complications. And most importantly, I wanted it to be usable with an existing workflow. I don't want to tell people, oh, you use Word to edit documents. Well, don't do that. Use Markdown instead, because then you can use my tool. Or use this completely different editor, which is really cool, which has this integrated thing, but doesn't have any of the other features you want. Because you'll never get people to adopt anything if you force them to use, stop using the tool that they use all the time and use your new super awesome tool. That's not going to happen. And I, I ideally want as much adoption of this as possible. So I wrote a script called Genderizer, very imaginatively named, uh, which replaces placeholder variables in the text uh, with the appropriate gendered words, um, depending on how the genders of the characters are configured. Um, it can also use singular they or arbitrarily defined custom pronouns as a side effect of the implementation, so I've put it in because why not? Um, it handles docx and odt as well as plain text formats. Uh, this is auto-detected from inside the script. You don't have to say what kind of file it is. Um, currently, I'm doing this with a very naive and probably horrifyingly hacky approach. Um, so both docx and odt are formats which are zips of directories of XML files, and inside there, there's an XML file where the content goes. So all I do is unzip, find the content file, do a search replace in there, and then rezip the whole thing together, which sounds terrible, and it's kind of terrible, and I'll, I'll discuss how to make it less terrible in the future work section. Um, and I have some command line options to print information about the configuration of the project, so you can look up um, what your current substitutions are, if, you're, if you've used any variables that are missing, um, or get a preview of like what your final text is going to look like. And I have some tests, and I have a skeletal documentation, which is not really existent, so it kind of doesn't count. Um, so the configuration, in the built-in configuration, there is a list of genders, which may inherit from other genders, um, which makes defining new sets of pronouns easy. Um, I mostly put that in so that if you want to use a specific set of neutral pronouns, which is not they, like Spivak pronouns, which I put in mostly as a proof of concept that you can do this inheritance thing, then you can just inherit all of the other ungendered words from the, the highest level um, they set without having to redefine them yourself for like all your things. Um, in the user config, the user can override and add new genders and words, so the user can use some set of uh, made-up pronouns and add extra words that I didn't think of to put in the default configuration. 
Um, the user config also lists the files inside the project which should be um, which should be used, which can either be an explicit list or a glob. Um, and the user can set the current gender for each character, um, usually um, using the surname as an ID. And that's going to be incorporated into the names of the variables that the, that the user can use. Um, and what the program does, it generates a list of variables and um, essentially it does a, a cross product of the character IDs and all the possible words. So for example, if there's a character called Smith, um, it'll generate a variable for Smith they, Smith there, Smith them. Um, and the variables in the text will be replaced according to the gender configured for each character. So if Smith is configured to be female, then Smith they becomes she and so on. And some variables you can also predefine with different values for different characters. So every character will have a unique name. Um, they won't all have the same name if they're a woman. Um, and I've also put in something that if you capitalize the variable, it, then the replacement will also be capitalized, which is what happens like at the beginning of a sentence for like for the pronouns. Um, the code, I will very briefly, I think, how are we for time? How much time do we have left? Oh, okay, lots of time, okay. I will show you my horrifying code. Just going to make this fill the whole screen. There we go. Okay, can is that visible? Should I make the font bigger? Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Can everyone see the back? Okay. Um, so imports a bunch of stuff. Uh, broadly speaking, I have some helper objects to read the different kinds of files, um, so that I can interact with the files without caring like what the underlying format is, um, and kind of work on their text. Um, I have like a plain text translator. That's for the sake of the preview. I know for a fact that, that this is buggy because I tried to make some more complex additions today and it didn't work so well, so that's, I'm working on that. Um, so I have, I have a general class for handling that zipped XML format in a relatively generic way, and then I have uh, subclasses for ODTs and docx files which just select where the content file is in that unzipped directory. Um, then the, the ob there's, only, there's one object, um, used by the actual um, substitution code. So the built-in config currently is embedded in the file because of my portable distribution choices, but I'm aiming to bundle this properly using some kind of utility, and then this will actually be in a proper external file, which will look much nicer than this. So there's uh, variable regex, and in theory, you could have like a different format for variables, but I might take that out because I don't really see a compelling reason to vary this. Um, so there's a list of genders. Um, uh, the default genders are male, female, uh, they, to use the gender neutral pronoun singular they, and then as a proof of concept, I'm inheriting um, from they to create Spivak pronouns to use all the same words except the different actual pronouns which are overridden. So then there's a whole bunch of default words which are, which are defined with equivalents for male and female, and the equivalents for they, and then essentially Spivak inherits from they but, has, but defines its own pronouns. Um, I don't have a use case for using Spivak pronouns, but it's there in case someone wants it. Um, so what does this do? Um, it, reads in, it reads in the config files from the project directory to override the and ad add to the settings with the user config. Um, then it creates all the substitutions by essentially combining the, the surnames that it reads from the file um, with all the possible combinations. There's a special case for variables that are already defined um, with with a surname included, which means that it's only for that character. Um, I will show you what the external user configuration looks like. Um, and yeah, and then it's when the user runs this, um, it just does the replacement. And by it, by it makes a copy, and by default it puts it in an output directory, but that's also configurable. And the idea is that this isn't going to modify the user's actual files because that's worryingly destructive and I didn't want to go there. Um, so the idea is that you can always just regenerate a copy and the original isn't touched. Um, and if I go right down to the very bottom, um, actually I'll show you the command line parameters from the help. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so you can print a list of substitutions, you can see what's missing, or you can get a preview. So in the example directory, um, let me just remove this old output directory. In the example directory, there are some files. Um, there's ignore the orig, that's, I think I made some exciting mistakes with version control today. Um, so if I look at the config inside the example directory, um, this is what a typical user config file would look like. Uh, there's a list of files. Um, here, there I actually have just a copy of the same file, but in three different formats to demonstrate that they all work. Um, and there are two characters, Smith and Jones. Smith is male and Jones is female. Um, and uh, I've defined individual names for Smith and Jones for the two different genders. And if I run, if I look at, if I look at one of the files in here, um, this is how the user would write the file. So um, instead of man, they would put Smith person and Smith name and Smith they here with an initial capital letter. Um, sibling is defined to be brother or sister and th the first name again. Um, and we can see a preview of what it's going to look like. And we give the project directory as a parameter. And this gives a plain text preview of how all the files will be changed. Obviously, if the files are very long, the user will have to page through this. And again, the, the fact that this is a command line interface is probably not super ideal for non-technical users. But again, it's in the future work section. And if we want to actually run this, oh, actually, I'll also show you what the formatted um, ODT file looks like. Um, if we look at. Look at this. Um, as you can see, I've actually used bolding in here to demonstrate that this will this will do the search and replace correctly um, in the formatting. I will close this. Okay. Um, and now, if I actually run this on the example, I now have an output directory. And in my output directory, I have copies of all these files, which have been modified. And I can have a look at the plain text file. And all these variables have now been filled in. And if I look at the modified ODT file, Um, this has preserved the bolding. Um, it's preserved the formatting, but it's replaced all the variables in here as well. And yeah, I think that is about it for how the program works. Um, live demo, it actually worked. Um, okay, so future work. Currently, this is not very pretty. It's one giant file with no dependencies, with a really hacky way of processing the, um, the various formatted files. There's probably a better way to do this. I know that there are utilities that, gen that d generate standalone executables like PyInstaller, so I'll probably actually switch to you know, having multiple files and using PyInstaller to generate executables that are bundled, um, as well as packaging this the normal way um, on PyPy with, to be installed by pip. Um, currently, it's a command line application, and as much as I love the command line, I know that not everyone loves the command line, and I think that it would be um, the experience would be greatly improved for non-technical users if they could see the previews, you know, in a window with buttons, and they could select files and they could generate the config graphically. So I'm probably going to add a simple GUI, possibly using Tkinter because it's portable. Um, you know, I suppose Web GUI would also be portable, but that would come with additional complications. I'm not quite sure. Um, this also requires actual testing on multiple platforms by people who are you know, interested in actually using the code. So I'm hoping to um, get some interest from people. Um, and so what are the other applications? So I use this for writing LARPs, but this is not the only thing you can do with this, obviously. Um, 
Uh, you could also use it for, for linear prose, for novels or short stories, if for some reason you want to you know, chop and change the genders of various characters in your short stories. You could maybe use it for computer game dialogue trees, if you want to. Um, so you, this could be used both for production output, if you actually want to produce you know, different versions of, of a work, um, or just unit testing for stereotypes. So I tried, I once, I, a few years ago, I read quite an interesting article, or possibly a comment on an article, which I've tried to find, but was years ago, and it's just impossible, um, about a, a writer who was writing a science fiction novel, and in his novel, he had created two made-up genders, which were not supposed to map onto any particular you know, real-world gender, but f as a shortcut, just to make his writing life easier, he used male and female pronouns as he was writing the novel. Um, or possibly he was, I'm not sure exactly how he wrote it, but I do remember that when he used some sort of search and replace technique to um, produce the novel with one mapping and then the opposite mapping to real world genders, and then he read what he had written, he realized that he had actually subconsciously been mapping the genders all along in a certain way, and it sounded very jarring when he put them the other way around because he realized that he'd made certain assumptions and used certain stereotypes, which was not what he intended. So after that, he found it useful to be able to switch between the two views to you know, see what he was doing. So, uh, I mean, your opinions may vary how useful it is to write gender-neutral characters. I'm a fan. I think that, it's, that it lets you avoid certain kinds of tired stereotypes um, and produce different kinds of characters. I think that if you do this in a role-playing game, it gives people an opportunity to play a character that might not normally be written f with, with them in mind. Um, but that's, a, that's more of a philosophical issue. Um, so I think this program could be useful to various people for various reasons. I have written it with one particular case in mind, and I've made that case as easy and as simple as possible and optimized for that case. But with little or no modification, it can probably be used for similar applications. So another note, this is an English language specific application, as if you speak any other language which has gendered words of any kind, I'm sure you are aware that it's much less simple than this. Um, in Polish, um, a lot more words are gendered than just pronouns and a handful of other words, and doing this kind of thing would be absolutely impossible without access to existing dictionaries that you can repurpose. So I'm not even attempting to go there. Um, I would be delighted if someone else did, but it's not going to be me. Um, so, are there any questions? Oh, wait for the microphone. Okay, so very cool concept. Thank you. Um, yeah, obviously it requires the text to be written using your identifiers, which like your science fiction author who used he and she pronouns, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to write if you don't use words you know. Yes, yes. Um, have you thought about using natural language processing to match character to pronouns? Um, I have not. Um, you mean as, isn't she trying to auto detect which pronouns belong to whom? Yeah, um, it's actually not that difficult. Hmm, it's an interesting point. I haven't looked into it. Um, I've just I've been assuming that it's not an easy thing to do, but possibly it is easier than I think it is. Um, so it would be it would be a cool idea because that is definitely a limitation of this. I've I've been using these pronouns for so long when I type my laps that I'm used to them, but for another person I can see how this would be very weird. I mean, another option is writing the entire lap first using using normal pronouns and then going in to like rewrite things, but that's a bit of extra work as well. Further questions? Um, I can also see a use for this in, say, formal or legal documentation where you have to always substitute in he or she or variants of that. So does your current script deal with spaces when you define the individual pronouns? Um, spaces where? Uh, so, for example, saying that uh, s uh, they equals he or she um, in your config file. I haven't checked. I don't see why not. I don't think I have anything that pauses that field and assumes that space is separated. So I think it would work. OK, good. Yeah. So yeah, he or she is another thing that you could probably easily encode into here. More questions? Not so much a question, but it's definitely something that can be put on a website where people can upload files to translate the genders. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, yeah, you could make like a web-based thing as well. That is mm. a, another possibility for an yeah. interface. I've got a lot of friends who are editors in a situation where the writer wants to change gender post-script. It's a perfect mm. situation yeah, for that's, it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also a good idea. More questions?
does it deal with honorifics? Honorifics? Uh, like titles? Um, you could put them in. I mean, I haven't put in like, mi so yeah, you could put in like Mr. and Ms. Um, I mean, it wouldn't, you'd have to put in like a special case so that you have two Mr.'s and then like a Mrs. and a Ms. if you're writing like a Victorian era novel where it's very, very important whether it's Mrs. or Miss. Um, but you can do it, yeah. You can, essentially you can, add w you can add as many words as you want to your local configuration that are like matched in the two genders. You just need to make up like a suitable like reference that you can use to refer to them. Uh, just to actually continue on that, is it easy to um, define like uh, gender variations in the script at the moment? So not just the different fields, but um, to support things like um, Mrs. versus Ms. Would you be able to define like two genders as oh yeah you could female yes. married and yes female yes you unmarried could you could yeah you like could that. that might actually be easier you could also do it that way where you have yeah you have a female married female unmarried and then female married can inherit from female unmarried and you can just change the one thing and then you do, you can you only have one cool any other questions cool then I think we'll call that a session okay cool. The Thank code is on much. GitHub, so you can go have a look at it if you want. And yeah, let me know if you're interested. Ah, one oh, more question. One, one more question. Actually, I would relate it to GitHub. Um, I Sorry, not on GitHub, on Bitbucket. But, uh, Bitbucket. I couldn't download the code of the script. Oh, that's weird. Sorry, I'll have, to, I'll have to check the permissions. I might have accidentally made the repository private, which was not my intention. Um, so I will fix that. Cool. Well. Um, just some short announcements before we close.